Hello Grinders, this is Characters, and welcome to a new series. Yay, new series time. This will not be a series to replace Characters and Carloters, the much-loved comedy duo of Grinder Skill. Fear not, for I'll be back with Carl probably next week, bringing you guys some more 10 and L Zoom action. But what I thought we would do, I kind of got this idea from the Definite Article, actually, who... Um, had a nice kind of idea, which was to sort of mix and match his series so they didn't become monotonous or whatnot. So I thought we can have two series running parallel at the same time, all the excitement. I know, right? This will be good. Um, three Betting in 2015 is the name of this series, and Orderly Approach is the sub name of this series. And yeah, I'll just stop reading through my presentation like the voice narrator of a Windows program um, and tell you what it's actually about like a human being. It is a series in which we are going to try to defeat the plague that is basically no one having any idea what the hell they're doing in 3-bit spots. This is a plague that I have noticed since I've been a coach and instructor. One area that people have always struggled with massively when they've come to me for coaching has been their 3-bit game. And that's, you know, it's a few causes really. One is just that 3-betting is really complicated, especially these days now that we've got all this range building theory and how to construct it and where to put all the different combos and that kind of thing. And how to have different 3-bet ranges against all kinds of different situations, different opponents, different spots, you name it, it's a minefield. Um, so the idea here is that I want to try as best as I can to compact the 3-bet theory that is around today into a manageable, digestible series of chunks. Um, in fact, I've kept the theory so condensed that I've fitted it all into today's presentation and I've even left time for us to do some example, an example at the end and then set you guys some homework. So my aim by today, I forgot to make that good old slide where you tell everyone what's, what's in store for today. That's like kind of, that's a good one. That's a keeper, but I forgot that. So, um, I'm just going to tell you today we're going to learn the theory. I'm going to show you guys the two types of range that you can construct when you 3-bit. I'm going to give you guys selection criteria for when you're going to choose one over the other. And then we're going to look at a spot and decide what kind of range we're going to have in that spot and what the nature of that range is going to be. Um, we are going to think about 3-betting very much as range construction and not as what to do in a vacuum with one pair of hole cards. So, this theme on PowerPoint looks extremely professional. I'm just like, watching. I don't want to go to the next slide because I just love that slide so much. Um, that's the magician carrot man. He's the one that goes out onto the street and um, sort of like, I don't know, like sort of busks for money with magic throwing chips and cards all about the place. Um, quite a hit uh, with the ladies as you can see as well. He's pretty slick and he's got smoke coming from his hands so that totally helps. He's the coolest of all the carrot men in fact. So he will lead us into this. Um, series. This theme, look at that box there, that theme, this theme has this annoying box which I will fill with annoying stuff. Sometimes I will mention what I've put in this box, sometimes I have just filled it because I cannot have an empty box in my theme, it's like obsessive compulsive, OCD much, right? Like the whole poker community, we're also OCD, um, but I can't have this box just sat there with nothing in it. So sometimes it has lame jokes in it, sometimes it has superb jokes in it, sometimes it has useful stuff in it, so it's your job to decide when you should be paying attention to that box and when you should ignore it as a little challenge for you guys, more fun. Today we're going to introduce the orderly process for determining what kind of 3-bet range to use and actually understanding the 3-bet game fully. Because I'm sorry, but as a community, you guys don't. So it's time to understand, it's time to break out of the dark ages of 3-betting and for this theory that the better players are sort of using and comprehending to become available to the masses without overwhelming and confusing newer players. That's my idea today. I want you guys to understand this just as well as a successful baller would understand this. Not that you guys aren't successful ballers, but perhaps you are successful ballers in the making rather than ones who have already crushed online poker. Or you wouldn't be listening to my voice, most likely. Why do people fail? This is the first thing I want to think about today. They fail because, and this grey text here is one of the few ones that's actually relevant. Um, I think therefore I 3-bet is obviously a rip-off of Rene Descartes who said I think therefore I am way back in the 15th, 16th century? No, 17th century? I don't know. I did philosophy, but I don't remember the dates. People were actually alive. Um, so he said, yeah, I think therefore I am, um, which was completely different. He was trying to say that 
he could only ascertain the fact of his existence. He could only know that he existed because he thought that was like his his starting point. And for some people, their starting point in three betting is, hey, I'm just gonna three bet. So I think therefore I three bet is like a phrase such as it means kind of like I'm able to think, therefore I'm just gonna three bet these two cards because they're in front of me right now and I just think I want to. So it's kind of what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to avoid the sort of um, non-thinking approach where you just like don't make any effort to think about your three bet range and what it should look like. That's what this model, that's what this um, orderly process, I forgot the term I used there, is all about. So the problems are these. First of all, people think about three betting in a vacuum, and that's wrong. And it's wrong because it's a very common preflop situation. And what you do in one three bet spot actually affects what your strategy is overall. And you maximize EV in the long run, not vacuum EV, but long term EV is maximized only by having the most profitable ranges and the most profitable strategy over the long run of all the times you're going to encounter the players you're playing against. So, for that reason, it's not the best way to approach this subject to think, I have King Jack, that hand has two decent blockers, I'm going to three bet. That's okay. But it's nowhere near the full story. It's not what we're trying to get at here with this series. What we want you to sort of get from this series is that you need to think about 3-betting in a range context. You need to think, what is my range for 3-betting here? There's been a lot of material done on this. Um, TDA did a series about range, the more mathematical side of 3-bet range construction. I did a series called "What, But What's Your Range, which was again quite mathematically based. This is not going to be mathematically based. This series here is going to be principally based. There are going to be a very, is hopefully going to be a very easy model to follow of principles so that you don't need to delve really deep into math to figure out what to do. It's more of a real world. What is the practical best thing for me to do with my range against this player in this spot to maximize my long-term EV? That's what our model is going to be. But those two series are still very much relevant material. So go ahead and watch them if you haven't already for sure. I can't remember the name of TDA's um, series, so you'll find it. Ask him. Maybe he can post on this thread and tell you what it's called. Um, so we need to think about 3-betting over the long run to maximize our long-term EV, because if we start 3-betting 7-deuce offsuit um, against an under-the-gun open, reasoning that our opponent folds enough that it's going to be profitable in a vacuum, that's great. But what you've done every time you 3-bet any hand is that you reduce future fold equity. Maybe not initially, but when you start doing it a few times, you definitely reduce fold equity because the numbers on your HUD go up, people start folding less, people start forbetting you more, it's the natural flow of adjustment and exploitative poker. Um, so if you want to maintain some degree of fold equity that's good for you over the long run, you really have to make sure that you're keeping your frequencies in check. And we do that by deciding, firstly, what's the best range to 3-bet, and then does my hand fall into that range? So instead of just saying, is it vacuum plus EB to 3-bet 7 deuce off, we're going to say, is it long term? the most plus EV strategy to be 3-betting 7 deuce off. You'll see how I changed the language around there to make it all about long-term EV. That's what we're focusing on. People's thought process is disorderly. Why did you 3-bet that king-queen? Um, it's a good hand and my opponent's opening wide. And I think that he's messing with me and I want to play back. That's disorderly because it's just kind of like random thoughts popping up all over the place that aren't really going in one logical direction. They might all be kind of reasons to 3-bet, some better than others. The fact that your opponent's opening wide is never a reason to 3-bet a specific hand. Um, it's a reason to have a certain kind of strategy that we'll get to later, but it's probably not actually a reason to, in itself, the 3-bet king-queen off, or at least it's not necessarily a reason. Um, so we're going to try and organize that thought process from the ground up. They don't understand the two types of 3-bet range. This is like our starting point. This is our base. This is where we want to begin our journey. And we're going to get to that very soon. There are two words you'll have heard all the time that I'm not going to spoil because I've got images to introduce them with and make a big impact. So I'm not going to tell you what they are now. Um, but you probably heard these words. So you can start formulating guesses of what the two kinds of 3-bet range are in your head if you like. I'm sure they won't be completely alien concepts to you in this day and age. They are quite common. Um, but it's very imperative that we understand exactly what they mean and when we should choose one over the other. That is our model. Um, it's like when you build a building. If you don't know if you're building a church yet or you're building a house, um, it's going to be kind of hard to build that properly because you need to know which one it is first before you start filling it up with hands. So the idea is very much the same. We want our blueprint first. Is it one or the other? Is it church or house? 
then we start filling in all the bricks and the cement, the actual hands that go into that range. So we need to understand these two types first. They don't understand when to apply the two types. They might have heard them, they might know roughly what each one is, but they might not know when they should be using a blah range and when they should be using a blah range. Again, we'll get to this in just a second. Don't spoil my, my impact of the pictures. Um, they haven't built default ranges. In my last pod, second last podcast, um, I'm doing a podcast series. If you haven't checked it out, please do. It's called The Eight Steps to Success right now. It's on the Grounder School um, part of the podcast season for this year. And it's very much about little things you can do to help your game that are not massive steps. Um, it was going to be called Big Baby Steps originally, but people told me that was too patronizing. Um, but the idea is it's little steps that you can take um, that are giant leaps in your development. A small step for my brain, a giant leap for my game. Um, and the idea with that series is that you must do these things to really greatly increase your EV. And one of those is building default ranges for 3-betting. So we will build, we've already built default ranges in earlier series. I'm not going to just go around the table saying cut off versus button, small blind versus button, and building ranges. What I'm going to do instead is just pick scenarios and get us really good at thinking on our feet about what kind of range we should have and what the nature of that kind of range is going to be. So it's going to be very much a dynamic kind of problem solving series using the thought process to solve for the best three bet range in each kind of situation not just building generic things to memorize. We want to be flexible. You're always mixing up your range. Those things we build in the mathematic-based series are more kind of, they're like our, our benchmarks, like where we start, and we should always be drifting off in exploitative directions with those ranges all the time. So that's what we're kind of looking at today, how to do that. Um, another reason people fail is just that 3 I think is really complicated. It's way more complicated than you think because although there's a lot of aggression going on and pots are getting like bigger and you know you're getting a more complex decision point than just open or not right so there's more factors going into it at the same time ranges are not so tight as they would be with like five bet ranges ranges are still relatively wide so the combination of those two things um the complex action of the three bet and all the things that that entails and then and all the effects that has on stack to pot ratio and all the things that changes you've got that on one side and then on the other side you've We've got the other side of the coin, which is the fact that even though um, it's a more complicated, more aggressive spot, ranges are still relatively wide. People are 3-betting kind of wide these days. They're not just 3-betting the nuts. Which brings me to the last point. People fail at 3-betting because they only 3-bet value hands. Like, what are you doing? Sorry, but you can't do that. It's 2015. ABC poker doesn't work anymore as, apply, as um, defined in 2006. In 2006, ABC poker literally meant... 3-bet for value, value bet, C-bet sometimes, um, never triple barrel bluff, rarely bluff turns, um, just play fair or fold and win money from all the horrible jewelers that can't press the fold button. That was fine back then. ABC poker now means a different thing, at least to me. If you want to learn to play ABC now, I'll say, okay, but I'll be teaching you 2015 ABC poker, not 2006 ABC poker, because this is 2015. So it's not enough anymore to say, I'm just going to 3-bet for value. There may be players against whom you might just want to 3-bet for value, that's fine. But as a, gener as a generic strategy, this is horrible. And it's a huge leak that people have when they come to me for coaching. What's your 3-bet percent? It's 2%. What hands are you 3-betting? The premiums. Okay, when you first learn the game, that's all right. But if you've been playing poker for a year and you've not moved beyond 3-betting the premiums, this series is for you. You're about to learn how to. Don't worry. Um, you do not want to be falling into this trap of just playing far too... Um, unbalanced. It's so unbalanced just the 3-bet, um, only the premiums. That's not why it's bad. It's bad because it just loses you lots of EV, as we're going to find out in this series as we go. This series will be an amount of parts I've not decided upon yet. Um, we'll see how it goes. There will be a lot of practical examples in solving for specific situations, finding the best range for a lot of different specific spots. So I'll flesh it out a good few episodes. Um, but yeah, I'm going to be continuing with characters and characters on the side as well. Carl's a bit busy this week as well, though, so I don't want to like hassle him into always doing a video, so this will dilute things nicely. So, there are two types of range. This is a little dialogue that I might have with my students when I talk to them. Basically, when we first meet in our introductory session in which we go through, um, look at their game, start to watch a video of their, and leak find their play, look at their stats, look at their graphs, speak to them and find out their thought process. When we do this, usually one of the things that rears its head as a leak in that introductory session is the, the lack of understanding for 3-betting and the lack of a 3-bet game. 
So here are the two terms. I've actually spoiled it before the pictures even come in. Um, so I say, the first question you should ask yourself when considering a three-bit spot is, I don't actually speak to them like I'm God, giving them a commandment. I don't know why I use that language. I think I started off like in a commandment, then I turned it into a quote that I might say. So I don't, if you hire me as a coach, I shall. I won't like sit you down and say, thou shalt three-bet jack nine suited. No, I won't do that. It's okay. Should I be three-betting a polar or linear range? This is the question I tell them to ask. If they can't answer that question, good. We found out where they're at and they need to learn that first before we can do anything else because if they don't know the difference between these two ranges and when and where they apply there's no point fleshing out a range yet. First we need to define that and we need to get this clear model in their head. They might say ah okay think for a while so what does that mean and then I'll say great or sometimes they'll just say okay and they'll pretend to know what a polar or a linear range is when they don't and that doesn't help anyone so they'll have to say so what is a polar range and they'll say um it's when you just have a value range and I'll say no wrong let's start at the beginning. So this happens a lot. Um, we need to build this part of their range, for the, their game first. We need to get this definition in place. Let's start with the polar model. In the polar model, um, we have a range that is clearly separated into hands, into two groups, basically. Your three-bet range, that is, is clearly separated. You may remember a series I did called The Spectrum. I think it's like characters 58 or something like that. I'm not sure. Type in Spectrum into the Grinder School search engine and you will see my two-part series come up. Watch part one. This is basically a polarized model. We didn't use those terms as well back then as we do now. So it's not totally up to date, but it is essentially the core of a polarized model. So a polarized range is one that's clearly separated into hands that are too good to call and hands that are too bad to call. So on the one end of the scale, you've got hands that you're three betting for value because they're too good to call. They're doing great against your opponent's continuing range. Remember value bets are not just bets you make because you have a strong hand, they're bets you make because you think your opponent will continue with worse hands and you have built a pot against a weaker range. That's what a value bet is. It's not just having a good hand. It has to be relative to your opponent's continuing range, not their opening range, which is why at the start of this video I said that your opponent opening wide is not a reason to 3-bet king-queen because if they're folding loads to 3-bets, king-queen's probably best served as a call and just playing against the dominated stuff while you want to be polarised and probably 3-betting them with loads of bluffs that you wouldn't otherwise be able to play if they weren't folding so much. This is the idea of polarization. We have hands that are too good to call that we 3-bet, and then we have hands that are too bad to call that we also 3-bet, and the latter are the bluffs. Our bluffs in a polarized range never ever ever come from hands that we're going to call, and that's because we want to expand our range and play as many hands as possible, and to do that we need to draw our bluffs from our folding range. This will become much clearer when we actually look at some example ranges that I've built. So we have value and then we have bluffs. They are very clear, there's a very clear distinction. If you have a polarized range and someone says, why are you three betting king jack suited? You should be able to say, I'm doing it because it's a value bet or I'm doing it because it's a bluff. If it's a value bet, then it's because you think your opponent will continue with worse stuff or you'll be able to like pick up the pot loads pre-flop plus post-flop plus get some value and you'll be doing decently well when called. If it's a bluff, then you think your opponent's going to fold some hands that are better than it or are doing well against it or something like that and you're going to have fold equity pre-flop. Um, if you have a polar model and you can't put it into either of those two groups, then it's not going to be a three bet. It's going to either be a fold if it's really horrible or it's more likely it's just going to be a call. If you're thinking about this, it's probably not 8-4 off you've got, it's probably some reasonable hand. If it's too good, if it's not too good to call and it's not too bad to call, then it's a call. Again, our bluffs in this model just never ever come from our calling range because then we would be playing less hands, we're using perfectly good calls as bluffs, it doesn't make sense. If we have a lot of fold equity and that's what we're going for, um, we should be taking those bluffs from our folding portion so that we're playing more overall. So everything we call lies in between. So every single hand that we're going to call is between these two polar poles, these two polarities. Um, it's like a globe. You have the North Pole, which is the value range. You have the South Pole, which is the bluffs. And in between, you have all the land and sea, all the world, and that is your calling range. And that resides in between those two. And there will always be a, a calling range and a polarized range. Let's think about this for a minute. Why, why is that the case? Let's have a sip of my tea while you think about that. Um, but no, that's the case because if you want to pause the video and actually think about that, please do. That might be useful. I think that the best way to put this is that um, if you didn't have a calling range, 
then you would be three betting or folding everything you were playing. Therefore, if you had this gap between hands that you were three betting, like say you were three betting ace king, and then you weren't three betting king jack, but you were three betting king ten, then you'd be folding king jack but not king ten. And that's just ridiculous. So in the polar model, the only reason the three bet bluffs are weak hands is because we're calling the hands above them that aren't value three bets. So there's always this procession of value, call, bluff, fold. There is a hand a flowchart decision making process for the polarized model, and that is can I three bet for value? If yes, please do. If not, can I call? If yes, do. If not, can I three bet bluff? If yes, do. If not, fold. And that model takes you through. I'm going to get to something like that later. I should have actually written that down here because it's really good. I might write it in the comments. Um, in fact, I will write it in the comments. I can't just say I might and then not bother. That'd be bad. Um, okay, so there's always a calling range. Everything we call is always in between our two polarities of three betting. Um, we have clear value hands and clear bluffs that are chosen for those reasons. And we've got the separation between hands that are too good to call and hands that are too bad to call. We three bet each and we flat the stuff in between. This bear here is happy with that. He plays a polar range, believe it or not. Um, he catches fish using a polar model. Next, an example of polarity. Um, this is a program called Poker Ranger. It is cool. Um, check it out. I'm not affiliated with Poker Ranger in any way, but I just think it's a really nice program. Um, so I'm happy to give the guy a service and say, hey guys, check out his program. It's really good, seriously. It allows you to make all these pretty colors, and I'm a sucker for pretty colors, that's why I bought this program. The green here is your value range. That's the range of hands we just talked about. The one that you are sure that when your opponent continues, you're going to be in good shape against them, or at least you think it's likely. They are going to be, you know, these hands will be great hands against his calling range in a three-bit pot. They're value hands. They're not just ahead of his opening range, they are ahead of the range he continues with to your three-bit. Then the purple are the flat, the flatting hands, the hands that we're just going to call with, and notice that they are weaker than the green, but stronger than the bluey turquoisey colour, which is your 3-bet bluffing range. So clear separation. Let me give you an example of a spot that we might actually use this range in. Um, let's say that this could be like we're facing a hijack open and we are on the button and we want to do a bit of mining, so we've got these pocket pairs or something like that. We can call like our best suited broadway, suited connectors, ace queen off. But then like the opener's quite tight, so we don't want the flat dominated reverse implied odds hands against him like ace jack off, king queen off, um, and the suited aces aren't quite good enough to flat either. So we've chosen a tight value range of queens plus ace king, so that if he does continue, we're okay shipping over a four bet, or we're okay um, playing a three bet pot against his continuing range. We've got the calling range that we're okay just calling with, we don't want to 3-bet it for value, but it's too good, mark my words here, it's too good to 3-bet as a bluff. These bluffs, if we weren't bluffing them, would not be calls, they'd be folds. These bluffs, these turquoise hands are coming from the white abyss, they're coming from the folding range, they're not coming from the purple stuff. That's the key of the polar model. The calling stuff is always in between the bluffs. The green is too good to call. The turquoise is too bad to call. The purple is a call. We're not three betting a calling hand because that's not in the spirit of the polar model. So this polar model is basically a good good to use in this situation for reasons we'll get to in just a minute. But basically, the fundamental of it is that our opponent's folding some amount, and therefore we can't three bet loads of hands for value. And we do want to bluff some hands that we can't call with, and we want to call with the stuff in between. The linear model. This is the newer kind of range that people all started reverting to like mad in about 2012. Some people think that you should just 3-bet linear all the time. I don't. I think that's horrible. Um, I think that being polar in many spots is way more plus EV. I'm sure there are people out there in the poker world who disagree with that. Um, I think there are loads of times and places to have a linear range against a bunch of regs and different and a load of spots. Um, but you need to understand that there are times for a polar range, polar bear, and times for linear range line of people. In the linear model, we 3-bet every hand that's good enough to 3-bet. But good enough to 3-bet here doesn't mean it has to be clearly for value. And then we flat or fold the ones that aren't good enough to 3-bet. That might seem a bit confusing. In the linear model, we do away with this notion of bluffing and value betting. 
It could be that we have aces in our range, and that's clearly a value bet, sure. It could be that we have a hand that's probably not a value bet, so that could be called a bluff. But it's not as simple as just really strong hands and really weak hands. It's, there's no polarity here. There's a continuous procession of hands. A linear model of 3-betting starts at the top, and it goes down to the worst hand that we think we can 3-bet. There's no gap in between. There may be a calling range, but if there's a calling range, it's going to be at the bottom. It's going to be the hands that are too weak to 3-bet. We're 3-betting the top X percent of hands. Why might we do that? We might do that because our opponent's calling all day, so we don't want bluffs, we just want strong hands. We may do that because we don't really want to flat many hands, so we're just going to 3-bet them, because it's the best way to play it. In that last example, we were on the button, and we were calling in an open with that purple stuff in the hijack with position, knowing that these hands are going to be plus EV calls against his opening range. Fine. If, for instance, we didn't want a calling range in some spot because our position was horrible, hint, small blind, we'll get to this soon, um, we might adopt a linear model instead and not want to be calling very much, and therefore we'd be 3-betting all the hands we're playing. So there may or may not be a calling range. There might be a calling range that's just like weaker stuff, that's not good enough to 3-bet, um, but it's good enough to call, like implied odds hands and things like that. Or there may be just no calling range at all because we've decided there's no room for one that's bad to call in a certain spot. Maybe we're getting squeezed a lot, maybe we're getting... We're not going to do well out of position. Maybe it's just better for us to 3-bet. These situations certainly exist, so we will get to them very soon. This is the linear model. Here's an example of it. In the linear model, you can see the sandstone kind of color there. I have not segregated the colors of the range. In the polarized model, we have this clear segregation. We have green, and then we have turquoise. Here, every hand that we're 3-betting is the same color. It's all sandstone, and that's because it's not so clear that there's a exact division of where value slides into bluff territory. Basically in this spot, we've taken every hand that we think we can that we can 3-bet for value probably, and we're 3-betting it. Any, I shouldn't use the word value, but we think it's a good 3-bet for whatever reason, basically. Um, an example of this range could be that a fish who opens fairly wide has opened in the cutoff and we're on the button, and there's another fish in the blind, so we're okay, like, we're loving playing multi-ways, we're flatting all these suited aces, we're flatting all these suited connectors, and even some off-suit broadways with position, and we're three-betting all the hands that we think are good enough to just build a pot in position against the bad player with. Something like that. We might even go wider there with the sandstone linear stuff if we wanted, but that's the kind of idea. We do have a calling range in this particular linear model, we won't always as we're going to see as this series progresses. Let me give you another example of a linear range. Say we're in a small blind, and there's a big squeezer ahead of us, and the button opens. We don't really want to fly anything there. It's not going to be very good. Um, so everything we play, we 3-bet, and in that case, you'd have just two things. You'd just have white hands that we fold, and you'd have sandstone hands that we 3-bet. You wouldn't have this calling range. But in this particular linear model, you do have a calling range. This is a spot where there's clearly an incentive to 3-bet wide for value, and there's no incentive to 3-bet bluff and there's an incentive to call with weaker hands to mine and see a flop in position. So this is a spot where we very much want to be linear. The one before, very much want to be polarized because we have fold equity and we have fish. Uh, we don't have, we're not playing against a fish, we're playing against a reg against whom we have fold equity and we just want clear bluffs, hands that we aren't, aren't quite good enough to flat. So, which type to use? This is the real heart of the video, I guess. Um, so, here are four general rules that shouldn't lead you astray. Try and apply all of them. Think about both. These are four rules about two concepts. The two concepts here are fold equity and how happy we are to flat, basically. How good the situation is to have a flatting range. So, the more fold equity our three bets have, the more we favour the polar model, which is like against the regular. The guy's folding a lot. So we have this 3-bit bluffing range, we are polar, because he's folding a lot. The more incentive there is to flat, the more we favour the polar model. Again, polar, lots of incentive to flat, that purple stuff is very plus EV, it's implied odds all over it, it it's got strong frequent strength, um, it's a good flatting range to play in position. So there's incentive to flat here, for sure. So we've gone with the polar model, we've answered very high to both of those questions. A lot of fold equity, or a good amount, and a lot of incentive to flat, therefore polar. Now we go, in, go down to the linear part. The less fold equity our three bets have, the more we favor the linear model. We're against the fish, he's not folding through our three bets, fish love to see the flop, therefore linear. The less hands we want to flat, the more we favor the linear model. Doesn't apply here, um, we want to flat loads of hands in this particular spot, but again, touching on that situation that I should have made a range for, 
in a small blind where the squeezer lies, lurks ahead of us, ready to squeeze us if we call. We don't want to call in that spot, so the less hands we want to flat, the more we favour linear. Therefore, every hand we're playing is going to be a 3-bet because we're not flatting. So it wouldn't make sense to like fold king-queen, 3-bet ace-king, and then 3-bet king-5 suited. It would be ludicrous. We don't want a gap there. We want a continuous possession because we are 3-betting every hand we're playing, so we just want to 3-bet the top X percent of hands. So there are two reasons, I guess, to be linear. One is like when you're going for a value-heavy range against someone who calls a lot, and another is when you don't want to flat. There are two reasons to be polar. One is when you've got a lot of fold equity, and one is when you can flat loads of hands, basically. But you do need, you generally need fold equity to be polar, because if this guy is opening pretty tight here, we don't want to be bloating big pots with like ace jack, um, ace two suited if he's never folding, because we're not going to be in good shape when called. The whole point of those hands is that they're bluffs, and bluffs need fold equity. You wouldn't bluff without fold equity, right? So you wouldn't have a polar range without fold equity either, because a polar range necessarily involves bluffing. It involves three betting hands that are behind when you're called. Therefore, you need fold equity. So it's not just enough to decide what kind of range you're going to use, because there are all different variants of polar ranges and all different variants of linear ranges. Some linear ranges are really wide and are like 30% of hands against a whale who you're trying to isolate. Some linear ranges are really tight against a fish that only opens 3% and you're just 3-betting like queens plus an ace-king for value. Or just kings plus perhaps if he's only opening 3%. Similarly with some polarized ranges. Some are balanced, some have equal ratios of like bluffs to value because the guy is not folding that much but you still want to be polar. Some have crazy values of bluffs to, to value crazy ratios, excuse me, of bluffs to value because you really want to be abusing someone who's folding far too much and not adjusting well. So, in the polar model, you have three questions to ask yourself. And following these questions in this order will ensure that you don't mess up the polarized range, because believe me, it's easy to mess the polarized range up. It's more complicated than the linear range. How wide should I 3-bet for value? That's the first thing you determine. And in this model, we decided we could 3-bet queens plus an ace-king for value, so we did. That's the first thing we've done, because what hands we 3-bet for value will directly impact what hands we call, which will in turn directly impact what hands we 3-bet bluff. This is the polarized spectrum. Everything we do has an effect on the range below it, or above it. It's all linked together. It's all one. How wide can I flat? The more hands you can flat, the weaker your 3-bet bluffs will be. Again, your 3-bet bluffs in the polar model never come from your calling range. They always come from your folding range. So the more hands you're flatting, the weaker the hands will be that you're 3-betting. If you're flatting ace to suited, because it's a good flat, it's not going to be a 3-bet, and then you might 3-bet king to suited instead. If you're flatting king to suited, then maybe you have to 3-bet suited queens or bad low suited gappers or something like that for your fold equity. How wide should I bluff in what hands? So that's a case of filling in the filling in the blanks here. Let me skip back. Sorry if this is annoying, all this skipping about, but I'll just do it one more time. Back to this polar example. You can see here I've not gone for 10-3 offsuit. That hand is not very good. Um, I only want a certain frequency here. We want a long ball strategy. It might be vacuum plus EV, 3-bet 10-3 suited if our opponent folds loads, but it doesn't mean it's good to do it. We should definitely not 3-bet 10-3 suited in that situation because we're wasting one of our valuable 3-bet bluffs because, as I say, the more we bluff, the higher our 3-bet stat gets and the less people fold against us and the more EV we lose through losing fold equity. So we don't want to waste our 3-bet bluff on that hand. Instead, we want to choose a hand that's great. Why have I chosen these hands here? To give you guys some flavour. Well, king-queen off and ace-jack off are double blocker hands. I expect my opponent to never fold any combination of ace-king, ace-queen suited, aces-kings or queens or jacks against me here. So blocking all of those to hell is really good. Why have I chosen suited aces? Well, I think these hands just play very well. They give me a bit more playability. They give my range a bit more versatility. Um, you'll notice I don't have many hands like 8-7 suited here. You can make arguments for uh, board coverage being more important, but I generally find at the micro stakes that people are not, um, not really aware enough to hand read you to the point that they could exploit that, okay, your 4-bet bluff range, your 3-bet bluff range always misses this kind of flop or something like that. Like this 3-bet bluff range always, always misses a flop like 7-7-6. But that's okay because people just don't know that. That's not information that's going to ever be used in the real world to hurt us, in my opinion. Some might disagree on that. I think they're wrong. Whatever.
That's okay to disagree sometimes. Um, so, with linear, the linear model, our life is a lot simpler. All we really have to ask ourselves is how wide should I be 3-betting? How many hands, what's the weakest hand I can get value from against this fish? What's the worst hand in my 3-bet range against this fish? Or how wide can I get away with 3-betting in this linear model in the small blind against the button open where I'm not flatting anything? Can I get away with 20% of hands or only 15 or only 10? How much is he reacting to 3-bets? How much is he folding? The more he folds, the more you can expand a linear range where you've decided to go for a linear range because flatting is not feasible. If flatting is never feasible, then you can you just can't use a polar model. You need to be able to flat something to use a polar model. So if you're not flatting anything, you're going to be linear. And in that case, you just need to decide how linear, how wide should I go. So let's do an example. I'm going to leave you guys some homework um, along with, like, I guess that is the kind of flow chart that I said I would post. Um, that's really, that's my new refined version of it, basically. The other one is was kind of just like, um, I guess if you're using a, a polar model, you can say, can I value through bit this hand? Can I flat? No. Can I through bit bluff? Sure. But here I like to actually differentiate. There's a different thought process for each one. The linear one is very simple because you just have one possession of hands in your three-bit range. The polar one is more complex because you have three very dynamically related but different ranges. So I'm going to use that for your model. That is your like follow-up questions to ask yourself. Our first example. This is ridiculous. This made sense to me this morning when I first got up. It's like like my son's first word was dada or something. Um, Kyle's first three-bit was polar. It's just like really lame. Sorry about that. Um, problem. Hero is in the big blind and a 22-18 regular who folds to 67% of 3-bets after opening opens to 2.5 bigs. Small blind folds action on hero. So very common situation. We're in the big blind here. We're going to talk loads in this series about how being in the big blind is just much nicer for us in terms of flatting. Remember, the more that we want to flat, the more we should consider being polar. We're in the big blind here. We can flat a lot, we're getting a good price. He's only made it 2.5x. We can flat a lot. That's good for us. That means that we should probably be polar, and it means that we should be using hands that would otherwise be folds as polar 3 bets. He folds 67% to 3 bets after opening. That's huge. Um, a lot of people still use the stat fold to 3 bet. I'd advise that you get that right off your HUD and you change it to fold to 3 bet after open, or fold to 3 bet after steal is even better for these kind of situations. What the fold to 3-bet original stat does is that it tells you um, how often people are folding to 3-bets anytime they face a 3-bet. It could be that they've not opened, they're just cold to the 3-bet, they're in the big blind, and cut off opened, button 3-bet, action to them, they fold, that counts. So the result is that it drives up this number, the number becomes really, really high in the 80s and stuff sometimes. I have never seen a player in my games, like 100 NL or whatever, that is... Um, folding to 80% of 3-bets after opening. That would be absurd. 67% is still really high. It means that you can print money very easily by like 3 betting any two cards. Here's a little quick example with a calculator. As always, you get to see that my weather is slightly improved from last time. Um, every time you use a calculator, you get a little weather check for Glasgow. That's great. Let's say the opener has opened like 2.5, as is here, and we are in, there's a dead small blind in the pot, which makes there a 3 in the pot, and then there's the big blind in the pot, which means there's four in the pot in total. Now, if I 3-bet here to eight big blinds, 2.5 to eight, then I'm risking only seven, because I already have one big blind in the pot. So I'm risking seven big blinds to win four. Risk divided by risk plus reward. Seven divided by seven plus four is seven divided by 11. Which means any two cards are plus EV to 3-bet in a vacuum if my opponent falls more than 63 0.63% of the time. He folds 67% of the time, so any two cards are plus EV in a vacuum to 3-bet. That doesn't mean I should 3-bet any two cards, but what it means is that my opponent's folding so much that I can be quite liberal here, and especially if he's not going to adjust very well, then I can be very bluff-heavy in my polar model. So this is a slam-dunk polar spot. I know people who would argue for a linear range in this situation. I think it's horrible. I think this is clearly a spot where we should be polar, where we should be flatting all those hands that play well against his opening range, 3-betting the ones that don't because he'll fold two-thirds of the time um, and 3-betting some quite a tight value range. So let's go through our thought process. In the polar model, we've decided on that one, so we're going through that thought process. First question, how wide should I 3-bet for value against this player? 
Right, here's a grid of hands, basically. This is Poker Ranger um, itself. My tea's gone totally cold, that's so depressing. Too much talking about this great topic, that's a problem. So, obviously we need to be a little bit tighter here because he's not continuing all that often. So I'm just going to give us a really tight value range. For big blind versus button, this is super tight. Like, not 3 betting like king jack, uh, king queen suited or ace jack suited or ace queen off or tens. It's super tight, but this guy folds, like, a lot here. Um, maybe we can go a bit wider than this. Perhaps something like that um, would be okay. But we shouldn't go too wide because we'll quickly get into territory where if we 3-bet, say, King Jack offsuit, we can't really do it for value because when he continues, he has only the top two-thirds of his button range. And King Jack off has pretty poor equity against that, probably less than 50%, and isn't doing so well, basically. So we're choosing hands that are still going to be in good shape to play post-flop in a 3-bet pot against the hands he continues with, never mind the hands he opens, the hands he continues with. So we've done part one. We've said... That's how wide I can 3-bet for value. Now, how wide can I flat? Remember, we're not even going to build the bluffing range yet because we still need to build the flatting range. And each one affects what the other is. So you have to do it in this order. If you build the bluffing range first, then you've maybe just consumed a bunch of profitable flats into bluffs. And that's like the cardinal sin of polarity. You don't do it. So, what we need here is the next group, basically. What is plus EV for us to flat against a 2.5x button open from a regular. Lots of stuff, in my opinion. All this stuff. This might seem wide to you. It's not that wide because I'll even flat all the pairs grudgingly because our price is so good. Um, it's not that I think they're great set mines, but it's just that we're only risking like 150 to try and set mine and we might win some pots without picking a set as well, which is kind of nice. Um, do you want to flat all the broadways here? I think you probably can. It's going a little bit wide, but it's maybe okay. So let's say that this is our... Um, this is our flying range right here. A lot of hands because he's going 2.5x, so we're very com comfortable and confident um, flatting loads. I just wanted those bold bits to go away. Sometimes when you like drag the mouse, there's a little glitch in the program, I believe, where it go a bit bold like, a, like that. Uh, you can get rid of it just by going like this. Um, I, I could give you guys a tutorial on how to use this program, but basically it's quite simple. This aspect of it is simple at least. Um, you have complete range here that you can use to, to highlight the main body and then by going into groups you can segregate it into groups. That's like the heart and soul of the program right there, these coloured groups basically as far as I can see. Um, so now we need bluffs. What are the best things that are left over here that we can bluff with? Well, we don't have the luxury of any suited aces because, sorry, but we're flatting those. They're not in our polar bluffing range because we're very polar in this spot. He's folding a lot. Um, let's go back to our model. What hands should I bluff? And how wide? First of all, how wide? Very wide, because this guy, well, quite wide, because this guy's folding a lot. How do I determine my ratio here? You use combos. The value range here has 60 group combos. There are 60 combination of hands that we are value betting. You can see here how they're comprised. Each pocket pair is six, each offsuit hand is four, and each suited hand is four. All adds up to 60. Calling range, 262, doesn't really matter. We're calling loads. What matters is our ratio of bluffs to value in the polar model. So if we want to go like 2 to 1 here, which is like quite relatively exploitative, you know, you're bluffing quite a lot if you're bluffing two thirds of the time in a polar model with a weak bluffing range, we could have 120 combos of bluffs. So let's start there. Let's make 120 combos of bluffs for ourselves. Um, should we be that wide? Yeah, maybe. I mean, it depends how he's going to react, but I think that's a kind of safe long ball kind of strategy because you're not going like, you're not going like so wide that if he reacts well, you're going to get totally crushed. You're kind of like covering your bases there a little bit, um, but you're going wide enough that you're really punishing him if he doesn't react, which is fairly likely that he won't adjust very well. So this range could print a lot of money while not being overwhelmingly obviously super wide. There, I went for 120. By guessing, I got 128 combos. You'll get that kind of feel as you go, um, remembering that these are 12, these are 4, um, and pairs are 6. So something like that. I've just picked like what I consider to be maybe the best hands, the most playable ones. Ace X offsuit, at least it has a wheel draw and it has like a, a blocker. These are suited blockers, these are good. Suited queens are also suited semi-blockers, they're okay. Jack 8 suited, bit of playability, flop ability there. Same with the low suited connectors and gappers. Um, yeah, that's a polar model for this spot. That's how exactly how I would play against this opponent in this situation um, that we described here of being in the big blind, facing an open 2.5x from a reg who folds a lot to a 3-bit. 
That's how I do it. Now, look at the homework, which is posted on the thread below. You will see six questions. Design a range in these six spots. And what I want you guys to do is go into them and choose what range of hands you are going to 3-bet in all six of the situations and you can get yourself a free trial of Poker Ranger you can go on there and you can build them you can post screenshots of them or links to screenshots or whatever um, you can tell me what you think your ranges are I can review them next time what I'm guessing is that no one will do this and no one will post it which will be really sad um, for Grinder School but because no one's really been posting very much sorry excuse me while I have like a little a little hissy fit about how I've not been getting enough feedback um, but yeah, I really hope you guys do this. It'll be good. Even if you don't want to post, like do it on your own anyway before you watch the next video, or at the very least, like think about it, because um, it will be useful for you. I'm only saying that out of love and because I want you guys to do well. It's not because I'm trying to be a dick or whatever. I just want you to get the most out of my videos because I'm putting a lot of work into them. So I want you guys to um, get a lot out of them basically for that work. So. This has been Characters for Grinder School. There's an intro to 3 back in 2015. Stay tuned for future installments of this series. Leave me your feedback. I hope you've enjoyed it. And stay tuned also for more Characters and Carlitters coming your way very soon, where we'll be continuing to own the 10NL uh, Zoom pool. And happy 3-betting.